my boiler just started. Okay, well if you can hear that, I'm sorry, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna push on anyway. So hello, welcome to day 52 of my daily lockdown videos, which I'm doing to uh, document the funny old times we're living in and also to keep each other company. And um, I thought that today I would just tell you about a movie I watched last night with Ben. That movie is the 2009 epic 2012, or 2012, I guess. It's 2012. Now, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a disaster movie um, about how the world was like supposed to end in um, 2012. Apparently that's when like the Mayan calendars ended, so that's when they were like predicting the end of the world. But I've also heard that that wasn't true, and the Mayans never thought the world was going to end then, but whatever. They really lean on it in this movie. They mention the Mayans at least ten times. But I have to say it was bad, obviously, but also a perfect movie to watch in lockdown because it's like you know what you're in for with a disaster movie. You get it. There's enough to like <laughs> to not make it a miserable experience watching it and there's enough to hate to make it an enriching experience to watch it and rip it to shreds, right? So, yeah, I just thought that I would talk about a couple of those talking points with you here today. I watched it on Netflix, by the way. It's on Netflix. Also, pardon the fact that I still have a box there. Although it might not look it from this one camera angle, we are getting a lot of work done <laughs> in regards to unpacking. The other house, we've left the keys now, so this is the only residence we currently are the key holders of, which is, you know, bittersweet saying goodbye to the old house, but I prefer this one anyway. So anyway, we were talking about 2012, weren't we? Right. So uh, first things first, this is not a deep movie, and there are lots of things that happen that like, you know, you could say it lays the groundwork for, but you could also say just you can see coming from a mile off from a mile away um and it's like in really cheesy ways as well like at one point there is like a couple in the supermarket one of them's i guess they're both kind of main characters and um they're having a gripe and the guy is like i don't want anything to come between us there's you you know an earthquake is coming and as he says it to her, then like there's a big split down the middle of the motorway of the of the supermarket, sorry. And it splits right between them and pushes them apart as the ground opens. And I was just like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, okay. And then another point of like, you know, while we're talking about things separating, this movie also shows you the Vatican and all of the people outside of it and everything when some like real stuff's going down and there's loads of earthquakes and everything so like you get to see that um oh god I forget the name of the painting but um it's on the ceiling of hang on let me look it up so it's yeah the um Sistine Chapel you know there's the painting of God and Adam on the ceiling and like it starts to sort of zoom in slowly on the painting in a zoom that is centered on like where their fingers are stretching out like that and you're like it's gonna me and ben were like there's gonna it's gonna crack it's gonna crack and then basically like before the chapel collapsed like a crack ran down between their fingers and separated god from people and like you know it was <laughs> the symbolism's all very very heavy-handed in the sense that like i really don't think they were going for heavy symbolism they were probably just like this would look cool and you know what it does also as the sistine chapel collapses is the sistine chapel in the vatican am i going crazy please don't call me out if that's wrong i will deliberately cry but I'm pretty sure that was in the same scene. Um, but yeah, like they show the Pope talking to everyone and I was like, they're going to crush the Pope. Like I was a little bit thinking like, surely this couldn't get a release if they're going to kill the Pope. But I guess they did kill the Pope technically, but it kind of happened off screen. So while all these disasters are happening and everything, the, all of the Vatican basically collapses and gets destroyed. But not the Pope, although you know he's there. So I guess they are implying that the Pope died. But then like nearly everybody dies anyway in this film, so. Spoilers. <laughs> um, 
but you know, it's about the destruction of the planet. So, you know, if if you couldn't glean glean that maybe some people were gonna, and it's just um. Obviously, I know that like it can probably be quite a balancing act to try and um, lay groundwork early in your film that you can then pay off later, but it's just so heavy-handed with it in so many places. Like at one point, there's like an engineer and a pilot of the boats they're all getting in at the end to save themselves from the giant tidal wave or whatever, and he's like, "The brackets are built to withstand just the initial impact of the water," and so then by now you're like, "So they're gonna break." <laughs> like something is going to happen with with the brackets. Okay, well I guess we'll just wait for that to happen. Oh, and also like the exposition between people is crazy, right? Like something that I always find really notable about a lot of films, and often it's like a lot of like relatively dated ones, like maybe we've become more sensitive to it now. But what I see in a lot of old films is that like I find it really noticeable when people don't act like people, right? <laughs> when they say things that sound like they're saying it off a script, it's not natural dialogue. Um, and then and then it just, for me, sort of breaks the tension, right? It's like, oh, I'm, it's the, um, oh, what do you call it? The uh, suspension of disbelief, right? Yeah, so it kind of breaks that, right? Because I'm like, oh, that's not how people talk. This isn't, <laughs> this isn't real. Which sounds dumb to say, because nothing you watch is real, but you know what I mean. Like, I think the lead actor is John Cusack, and at the beginning of the film, he's divorced from his wife, and at the beginning of the film, he takes his kids on a camping trip, and they're obviously really not enjoying it because he sucks and he's bad at it and he was late initially right like we see that he barely wakes up in the morning and so then he's late to pick them up to take them camping and then when he gets there he doesn't have any mosquito spray for them so these kids are getting eaten alive and then there's this preteen this one of his teenagers is a sorry well, i guess a preteen like one of his kids is a son He's got a son and a daughter, and the son is kind of just like a bit annoyed about it and is just like chewing him out a little bit um and when he says something to him about the camping sucks or he wishes that his stepdad was there or something and John's like, that hurts my feelings when you say things like that and he like zips and the kid zips up the tent and shuts him out and is like, bugger off. And he doesn't say that, but you know, like emotionally that's what he tells him to do. And then so in what I think is quite a violation of privacy, then John Cusack looks at his kid's phone and what he's been texting and it turns out this kid has been texting his stepdad like having a text conversation with his stepdad saying like, hey Gordon, camping sucks. Mm. And like, you, <laughs> on what planet is a kid texting their stepdad for casual conversation? Like that doesn't happen. He'd have like some little shitty mates from Fortnite or something. I mean, I know this was 2009, so maybe like, I don't know, RuneScape, Halo forums, was Halo a thing then? I don't know. But yeah, so the kids like Gordon their stepdad, their stepdad's name is Gordon, which I assume is because he seems for all intents and purposes to be a pretty decent guy. But for reasons that aren't, I feel like maybe there was an explanation in there, but it wasn't good enough. Like the couple I mentioned earlier, that's the kids' mum and their stepdad, Gordon. And they're having an argument about John Cusack's character in the supermarket. And it makes Gordon seem really neurotic. And at first he's sort of saying like, oh, you always change when he comes up. What do you even see in him? Like, he's he's a bum. And all we've been shown so far is that he is a bum. But like, this woman who has clearly like, divorced him and taken the kids away and started a new life with someone else she's defending him, <laughs> which like, I, I don't get personally. When he's like, oh, he, he's just like a, a shitty author. And she's like, he's a published author. He sold nearly 50 books or something like that. Like, it, it's really pathetic the number of books that he sold as an author, John Cusack. And so she's defending a layabout, like a useless layabout, who's not like a fantastic dad. Clearly he's trying, right? We have to give people points for being earnest, but it just makes Gordon's complaints seem kind of actually valid, even though it's being portrayed as him being really neurotic, because she's clearly still hung up on him while he is a bum, because she's defending his... <laughs> defending him, right? I don't know. But to some extent, it's still not how people act, because why would you neurotically be going on and on and on about it in in that way. I mean, Gordon really seems to feel self 
conscious about John Cusack and I don't think he has any reason to be. And then that's obviously when it happens with like all of the cereal on the entire shelf does this when the earthquake starts and the mum's like, did you see that? And then Gordon's like, see what? Because he's clearly so involved about thinking about John Cusack stealing his wife that he doesn't even notice that the ground is moving enough to shake everything on the shelf. But then that's when he's like, oh, I don't want this to come between us. And it's like, you're kind of dramatizing it a little bit because you're just having a squabble. But then that's when, you know, the ground opens up and pushes them apart and everything. And there's a point in the film later where like they're in a little camper van and they're having to outrun like a pyroclastic flow and lava and stuff like that. And he needs to, John Cusack needs to get a map out of the camper van, right? And he's been told like, oh, it's on, um, it's uh, X place on my bookshelf um, in the camper van. And so John Cusack has this camper van and he runs in there and he looks on the bookshelf and he finds the spot where the guy said, and there's like a stack of papers, like maybe like five to 10 papers or something like that. And he needs to find a map. So then John Cusack, and there's like a pyroclastic flow, like all of the smoke and lava and stuff and eruptions and like the ground's breaking behind them. And it's like approaching the camper van. And so he's in there like looking through these papers desperately to find the one he needs. And it's like, John, you could hold all of that in one hand. Just go, book it, cheese it. What are you doing? <laughs> looking like, do you know what? You really, if you can't carry four extra pieces of paper and figure this out later, then I don't think you should be the protagonist of a disaster movie. But you know, obviously he survives and he finds all of the different pieces no, he just finds the he finds the map in that little pile of paper and stuff like that. And it's just like <laughs> the action sequences in sequences in this film are fantastic, right? The effects fantastic. It's it's all so so good. But then like in a film where all the action sequences are normally so good at building tension, why do we why is he why is he taking a little break to go through all the individual papers on that shelf? To me that just seems dumb. Like also there is kind of like a a good indicator in this film, right, is if there is a really hot extra, something bad's about to go down, right? <laughs> ben and I noticed this because almost every time that we were like, oh, he's, he's kind of cute, he's kind of cute, like, <clears throat> something big happens, something erupts, something bursts out the ground. Yeah, so he, John Cusack rents a small, like, hobby plane from a dude, and the dude is like, when they get back to the plane. Right, so he rents a hobby plane, right, to drive his family away. Then he goes to pick up his family, and when he gets back, the hot guy he hired it from is dead, and everything's going wrong, and the ground's collapsing, and it's like, because they introduced a hot side character. Then when they're in an airport later on, there's like a there's like a hot airport attendant, and he like is looking out the door, and then like that's when everything starts collapsing, and another big pyroclastic flow is coming, because he was hot, it was his fault. Then the president at one point as well is like going out into like this really busy area, I don't know, that is surrounded by crowds and paramedics and stuff like that. And then he talks to this one really hot paramedic. And then after he talks to the hot paramedic, like they're looking up at that like, um, oh, what's it called? I'm going to get skinned by Americans. You have like that big obelisk and it's like in front of a reflecting pool. I don't know, that falls over. And, you know, it's because the president talked to this hot, this hot dude. Like, maybe it's like nameless hot characters. And maybe the paramedic had a name, I don't know. And then at one point, um, there's like, I think it's the jazz man, is it? One of the jazz men on a cruise ship. He's really old and he calls his son because he's been tipped off that the whole world's going to shit. So he calls his estranged son to talk to him. And then obviously, like... Lo and behold, that son's really hot. And when his like adorable little daughter is like, oh, are you and my granddad? I'll go get my dad. And then she goes and gets him and he gets out of bed and it's like, ooh. And then, you know, they get drowned by a tidal wave, I think. And then there are sort of like, you know, some more broken down ways this happens. Like there's a really, really hot engineer guy who was welding one of the ships they all get into at the end. I think his name was Tenzin. And when we revisit him and we get a solid good look at him for the first time, suddenly it's like, oh, we miscalculated. The wave's going to get here so much sooner. And it's like, you know, it got to the point where we like near and near and near at the end, there'd be some hot dude and we'd be like, something bad's going to happen. But then I feel like that's self-fulfilling prophecy because this film is about bad things constantly happening, right? And like, there was this main scientist guy, right? And he was like the the moral the moral guy in the government, I guess. Like he was the voice of reason and he's just constantly realizing new ways that everything's not cool. And to some extent I was like, you know, 
kind of wanted him to just shut up a little bit. <laughs> God, I, I might end up being the villain in one of these things. But at one point, towards the end, they've like got the doors shut and everything like that. And they're like, if we open the doors again, we can let everyone on and then we can shut the doors and then we can book it. But they've only got like 10 minutes left. And they've already established at this point that everyone that's out there has bought tickets to get on these boats in order to like for them to raise the money to make these boats so it's like they're seedy billionaires and stuff some of them are like the people that worked on the boat and stuff so i guess that counts i don't know morally he's in the right okay but because he reopened the door lots of people died and also because john cusack snuck onto the boat but like i won't get into that you can watch the film but i was like oh why why does he look so familiar the scientist guy who's really cute and he's getting it on with tandy newton and um so then i looked up his imdb to try and find out like why it was i recognized him and actually i didn't know him from any of his roles but i found out that he played lola in kinky boots so that was <laughs> so that was cool i was like do you know what i really would have jazzed this film up is if you were wearing like knee-high red sequin boots this whole time with like these like fat six inch heels it would have like it would have really turned this out i think and so speaking about the boats and the arcs and stuff like that i just want to say that i think those boats would have crumpled like tissue paper with the stuff that they put them through it's like the giant robots rule right like the reason we can't make giant robots is because we can't make huge metal structures that are robust enough for us to just jab into the ground as it walks along right it would buckle and bend because it's huge and heavy and if you were to just like pick up a building and go douche 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 like that building's gonna collapse we can't build things that are that robust but you know once everyone's inside this once everyone's inside this giant arc this giant boat that might as well be a fucking shoot a five mile long bullet right like it's just solid and they're like bashing it against mountains and stuff like that and it's scraping against stuff and it's thrown up against the edge of like rock formations and stuff and it's just like okay wow that would be in pieces if you did that to a cruise ship it would just it would disintegrate right it would disintegrate it might it was really like there were a couple of moments in this movie particularly around these giant boats that activated my um i forget the word i keep <laughs> I have like a fear of very big things, right? Like, but only very specific, very big things. It's it's strange, it's weird. But um, megalophobia, I feel like it might be megalophobia. But um, there are a couple of shots where I was like, Ugh. Um, and I think to round up, right? This movie was shitty to Gordon. Like, real shitty to Gordon. As the stepdad, right, he's clearly got the harder time getting along with everyone and making it seem like he's cool. And everyone, you know, the he just seems to be portrayed as not deserving of the family he's got. Where, like, uh, you know, and he's, he's saying things to John Cusack, like, oh, they're not my family, they're your family. Apart from, you're raising the children because they live with you, and also you're paying for everything they do. And also you make the wife happy, right? Like, it's... I feel like it's very recent old Hollywood family stereotypes, right? And he's really like, you know, he's a good pilot, he's a doctor or like a plastic surgeon, but he's a very successful plastic surgeon. He's just very capable and he like, you know, keeps saying like, oh, I can't fly, I'm not a pilot, as if we're supposed to believe that actually he's a bit like, you know, a bit useless, but he's not. Everything they ask him to do, he does like basically completely successfully at the tip of a hat. And he's flat out clearly more there for the children than their own dad is let alone more capable because you know he's well organized and lives in a nice house whereas this other guy lives in a a shit heap and is late to everything i still can't get over like what what kid texts their stepdad for a gossip about how bad the camping is that was <laughs> it was weird to me but yeah like spoiler alert spoiler alert um you know it was very very obvious that it was going to happen but gordon dies at the end and then, like, minutes later, Gordon's not, Gordon's not even cold yet. John Cusack's kissing his ex-wife. And it's like, Gordon just died. This is not fair. Like, how can you ditch so... And they do, like, a pretty reasonable... Well, a pretty unreasonable, in my opinion, um, early establishment of John Cusack and the wife still definitely having feelings for each other. They're, like, soothing the kids together. And that's what spurns Gordon to be like, you know, this is your family... And 
I don't buy that. I just don't buy that. Like, the idea that John Cusack is waiting in the wings just to get his family because he deserves it, like, that's not... I don't I don't gel with that, I don't think. Like, if you're useless and you can't, you know, be a good dad and a good husband, because she talks as well about how John Cusack was never there because he was always on his laptop writing books and stuff, never paying attention to the kids or anything like that. But this guy pays so much attention to the kids that the son wants to text with him while he's camping. Like, clearly he's being more present and more there for them. So the idea that just by virtue of being a protagonist, that, like because he has a wife and kids, they should be his automatically. He's owed them by the end of the story. Nah, that doesn't gel with me. I liked it. I really liked it, right? Like, it was really just, it's trash. Like, it's obviously trash, right? But it was a good watch. And I think in terms of quarantine, sometimes you just need to fill an evening with something. This is that kind of movie, right? (laughs) Just something to fill your time with. None of the actors are particularly... good i want to say like i like them i like all the actors but they're not grand like no one really impresses me in this movie but it was it was a fun romp i really enjoyed it and you know sometimes it's fun to watch things that you can then shred afterwards that's all part of the fun right so uh yeah i guess that's my opinion on 2012 and i should say that like the the idea of just like giving my thoughts on a movie to the camera like this was kind of inspired by Jenny Nicholson, a YouTuber who I've been watching a lot of recently. And I just thought, why not, right? It could be a fun thing to chat about. And I've gone on for like nearly half an hour already. So clearly I had fun doing it. But um, that's it. Okay, bye.